I had a chat with some of your colleagues before we sat down for an interview, and I asked them, what question should I ask you? And I won't say who it was, but one of your colleagues said that I should ask you, in all your research over the many years, what do you think is your most controversial, radical idea? And why is it really a traditional belief? Why is it really not so radical? Uh, well, I had many. <laughs> All right. I saw, you know, sometimes they take academic research and they make like a, a catchy headline out of it. Yes. I saw recently there was a headline in Haaretz or one of the Israeli mm -hmm. newspapers. Professor Israel Nall says that uh, the Jews did not kill Jesus. Yeah. Do not have to be blamed by killing, killing Jesus. Jesus. Yes. This was, that ca came out with my... Last book, yes, that's true. Why? Why should we not blame the Jews? Oh, uh, what I claim in this book, uh, the Messiah confrontation, is that when Jesus is is brought to the house of the high priest to a trial, uh, it was a exceptional trial. Why? It happened at night and according to rabbinic laws you don't judge especially capital punishments at night. It is possible and this is depend on the details in the New Testament that it was in the Lela Seder time in the first festival of Passover right. because according to what we call the synoptic gospels namely the, syn the gospels that we can read one by the other because they are similar which are Mark, Matty and Lucas they say that the last supper was Seudat Lela Seder so the trial which took place after it was in the first evening of, of the Passover and for sure uh, uh, the rabbis would not come and uh, the Pharisees who, who were before the rabbis would not come to any legal consultation in the time of the Chag. Uh, according to the Gospel of John it was the eve of uh, the last night before Passover. Anyhow it's not a time a good time for, uh, for, for judgment for court according to Pharisaic rabbinic law. So if you read the details in the in the synoptic gospels, you will see that they were not there. The Pharisees were not there hmm. in the in the trial. Hmm. They were the 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 priests, the high priests, and the scribes who were close to the priesthood and followed the priesthood. But Pharisees are not mentioned in this trial. Hmm. They did not come. Mm. I can imagine to myself that they sent to knock on the door of uh, Rabbi Gamliel Azaken, who lived in that time in Jerusalem, is mentioned also in the in the New Testament, or Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, and and uh, come, come, we we have to have a trial of uh, one person from Galilee. His name is Jesus, uh, 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 son of Yosef. And he would say, now? In the evening? If Passover evening? If he said it day bef if before Passover, I, I have to do Bdikat Hametz, I can't come. I have to check for unleavened bread. This is not the right time. Are you crazy to make a trial this night? So they disappear. And the fact that they were not attending there was crucial. Why? As I said, there was a great debate about the Messianic idea in biblical times. The Torah, mainly the Torah and also the book of Hosea, were not enthusiastic about the idea of king, kingship at all. It's something that 
Oh, if you would say, I want to have a king like the nations around me, this is what you do. It's not like a Tchila issue. The Lechatchila, the ideal issue is that God is the king of the Jews and they don't need a, an earthly king. This is the time of the judges. The judges are coming to save you from your enemies. You don't need a king. King is, God is the king. Malchut Shamaim. The, the, the kingship of God. This was the idea. However, as I said, however, as I said, uh, in the Psalms and in the prophets, there are those who magnify the, the figure of the king, the king, the Messiah, as to become a son of God, sitting near on the right hand of God, having eternal life. So it's, 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 a, it's a real debate. The Pharisees and the rabbi after them mainly follow the messianic ideology, mm. like Jesus himself. Mm. They didn't agree that Jesus is the Messiah, but they agree that the people of Israel should wait for a messianic figure would, would ha that would have a higher elevated status that he can be described as the son of God mm. and he can be described as in Psalm 110 and sitting on the right hand of God, etc., etc. So this was the Pharisaic view. They were pro-Messianic. In the later scenarios... And not just any Messianism, a divine Messianism. Divine Messianism. Yeah. Mes when Rabbi, uh, uh, Rabbi Akiba, who lived uh, a, a generation later, he was one of the main uh, leading figures uh, after the destruction of the... The, the temple, maybe the great figure of the rabbis after the destruction of the temple. He had a debate about a book of Daniel. In Daniel 7, there's a description, then it's an Aramaic, it said, Kursevan uh, Remayu, two thrones or chairs were put in heaven. So his fellow asked him, why two? I understand that one of, for God, but who is sitting on the other throne on, besides God? And he said, Rabbi Akiva, Echad lo, veechad le David. Namely, the other throne is kept for David, for the messianic figure, for the Davidic Messiah. So he agreed that the, that the Messiah should be elevated to a semi-divine status and take a chair on, on the right hand of God. Yeah. Can I ask, where did they get this idea from of a divine Messiah or semi-divine Messiah? In the Bible? What, what are the origin outside of the Bible? Sure. This is your question? Yeah. I mean, because you're saying that the rabbis are getting it from the Bible. Yes. So where's, okay. where's the Bible getting it from? Okay. I, I will tell you. As I said before, when the people of Israel are coming to God and say, Asima alai melech kechol agoyim asher svivotai. This is uh, the story in Deuteronomy about the law of the king in Deuteronomy 17, but also the story of the, this conversation between the people and Samuel, when the people came to Samuel and asked him to point a king over them. Do you mind just translating that, that verse? Yes. I, please, I would like to have, to put upon myself a king like all the nations which surround me. Namely, we see the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Canaanites, all of them are, their political system is kingship. Right. They have kings. Monarchy. Monarchies. And... The king, the, 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 in, in the book of Samuel, the, 
necess necessities that turned them to this direction is that they were defeated by the Philistines. Why? They didn't have good army because the army was an army of volunteers. Mm. They didn't have trained army. The, the Israelites. The Israelites. Right. Yeah, like in the Song of Devorah, always you bless the, the volunteers. Why? Because this is what you had. I mean, a nation without a king, <laughs> nobody can come to, to, to a person and say, oh, you will be a, a trained officer. Because the, the person would ask, who will, who's going to pay me? Right. And there were nobody to pay right. him. If you appoint a king, the king will collect taxes, and from the taxes he will have F money to pay to pay the army. Right. The army has to eat. Right. The army is marching on the food, right? Right. right. So there was a crisis uh, in the time of Samuel, and because the Philistines, they were very trained. They were immigrants which came from the area of Greece with a long tradition of, of, of uh, war and, and the people of Israel so that they, they, they can't maintain it. The Ark of the Lord was captured by the Philistines. Right. Right. Tragedies. They, yeah. they destroyed Shiloh, the, the, the most holy place where the Mishkan said right. They burned it. Right. We know it also from archaeology. So they came in panic, I, I would say, to, 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 to Samuel and said, please, appoint us a, a king like all the nations around us. Asher, the one who will be our commander in the time of a war. And he will be able to prepare an army for the war. And this is what Samuel didn't like the idea. Uh, and, but God said, okay, I, do, I either don't like, like the idea, but just do what they want. And he did, and they appointed Saul, and Saul started by collecting taxes and creating uh, an army. However, step by step, when you adopted the foreign institution of monarchy, you also bought with it the ideology of monarchy. Mm. And what was the ideology of monarchy, let's say, in Egypt? The king is divine. The king is a son of God, etc., etc. Namely, uh, Egypt and Babylon, not in the same way every culture had its own way, uh, uh, their concept of monarchy was that monarchy is divine. The king has some divine attributes. And, 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 and uh, of course, this is also with some political uh, issues and necessities. If he... If he's the son of God, you, you are not going to rebel him so fast. Right. Okay, so <laughs> the package, when we, when we borrowed the package of monarchy from the nations, it came with a package, I would say. Hmm. If you, if you Interesting. Want to, to Interesting. But how do we get from monarchy to messianism? I see, okay. the, I see you, divine monarch, but why divine messiah? Okay. What happened is that, uh, and this is the beginning of uh, my book in English, uh, uh, um, uh, The Messianic Confrontation. The, the turning point happened in the time of the Navi Yishayahu. Isaiah the prophet. No, Yishayah ben Amutz. Isaiah, son of Amutz. Mm -hmm. Because... The king of his time, Ahaz, was attacked by a coalition of Aram and northern Israel. Aram, uh, which is Syria of today, uh, the king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliyahu, 
the king of Israel. They made a coalition and they said, Naale be Yehuda venekitsenna venamlich melech betocha et ben toval. Let us go to Judah, to the Lord, southern kingdom, and we will put an end to it. And we'll throw away the house of David, and we will appoint a puppet king that will do what we want him to do. This was the plan. And this is told in Isaiah chapter 7. And Isaiah met the king and told him, trust God. The donkey of Isaiah had a sticker. Judah, trust God. In God we trust. And this is what he told... A bumper sticker. Yes. <laughs> don't, don't be afraid. Right. Nothing will happen to right. you. Just trust the Lord. King Ahaz, he tells this too. Ahaz. Yeah. But Ahaz was a person of real politics. He said, oh, to trust God, how many soldiers it, it gives me. Right. And instead of trusting God, what he did was that he sent gold and silver to the strongest force in the Middle East of his time, which was Assyria. Tiglat Pileser III, king of Assyria. And he sent a letter with the gold and silver that he took from the treasures of the temple. He said, I am your son and your servant. Namely, I give up my independence. I'm now a servant king for you, not real king, a vassal, a servant, a dependent king. Mm -hmm. Come and help me from the hand of my enemies, Aram and Israel. And Tiglat Pileser was pleased to take the money and uh, what he did is that he invaded first Aram, conquered it, and put an end to the king of Aram. Aram didn't exist anymore after this. This was 733 BCE, no Aram after that. With Israel, he was a little bit with Midat Arachamim. He just took... That's uh, a mercy. He, the, the area near the sea, the Galilee, and Transjordan, and he left them the mountains of Samaria for another 10 years. After that, they rebelled again and lost everything. But Judah itself gave up the independence that was acquired by David hundreds of years ago. So... Isaiah was so much disappointed that he said, oh, oh, I don't trust anymore the current representative of the house of David. I cannot apply to this weak person the glorious words which are written in the Psalms about the king, the Messiah from the house of David. It should be taken from now on as an anticipation mm. to the future, mm. not a description of the current reality, but a hope and anticipation for a future figure, still from the house of David, who will come and fulfill the great the great expectations. See. And this is what we call the Messiah. I see, I see, I see. <clears throat> Fascinating. I could see that you, you live these stories there. Yes. <laughs> so let's b go back to Jesus' trial. Yes. So I said, would the Pharisees sit there? They would not let the the, tr the the court to give Jesus that penalty. How do I know? Because there were later two cases where followers of Jesus 
were brought before a mixed, a mixed court, Pharisees and Sadducees. What happened? One was the 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 uh, trial of Petrus, and the other one was the trial of Paul. In the trial of Petrus, Rabbi Gamliel, this is what we call in rabbinic. Petrus circus, is Peter. Peter. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the in the trial of Peter, Rabbi Gamliel, this is what we call Rabbi Gamliel Azaken, the one who lived in in Jerusalem before the destruction of the temple. The elder. The Rabbi, yes, Rabbi Gamliel, the elder, he said, "Oh, messianic idea. This is a complicated issue. Leave these people. We don't know. Messianic expectations are several candidates. Complicated. We can do anything. Let him go." Paul, when he came to the to his court, he said, "I see that there is half Sadducees, half Pharisees. Pharisees, my brothers, we share the belief in resurrections. They, the Sadducees, do not believe in the resurrection. I go with you because we have a common belief: resurrection, which is true. The Pharisees believe in resurrection. The the Sadducees rejected resurrection. So he was." Also acquitted. Yes. Mm. So I imagine that if the Pharisees, if the court, the trial of Jesus would happen in another timing, a timing that was crucial for the Pharisees, and they would come there, the result would be absolutely different because they would say, "Okay, he claims that he is the Son of God. We 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 don't agree that he is the Son of God, but we." Agree with the idea that the Messiah would be called the Son of God. Right. It's a it's a pasuk in Tehillim. It's a it's a verse in in the Psalms in Psalm two. How can we reject it? So when the high priest said, "Oh, oh, this is blasphemy to say I am the Son of God," immediately death penalty, the Pharisees would not take it. Would not agree to it. Mm. Fascinating. What's the verse in chapter two? It said, "Elohim amar elai bni ata ani hayom oladeticha." God spoke to me and said, "You are my son. Today I have begotten you." Right, right. Referring to David and then referring to the Messiah by extension. Was Jesus making, in the eyes of the Pharisees, was he saying something that was controversial or radical in his application of that idea? No, no. I don't think that he had a, a, a real debate. Uh, the debate that he had with the Pharisees was in, in, in the area of messianism, was not on the picture of the ideal messiah, but the question was he the true candidate? This right. this could be a debate. Right. The the, uh, the the picture of the ideal Messiah he shared the same picture right. with them. Right. The differences that he had with the Pharisees were on minor halachic issues, namely uh, Shabbos law. Not that he desecrated the Shabbos, but he he saw that you will be the, when you have a conflict between Shabbos and Pikuach Nefesh, namely the need uh, of life of a person, he was going to Kula, namely that the, the value of human life is, is sure above the value of keeping the Shabbat. Not that he didn't keep the Shabbat, of really? course he kept the Shabbat. <laughs> when you have this conflict, and you know, this is a typical typical uh, stories that goes among Jews for generation what to do uh, let's say uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a famous story of na of some of the briske rabbis there's a great family of Lithuanian rabbi uh, uh, brisk uh, the, the, it's a story about Reb Chaim or, or or Rabbi Yosheber, the Alter Rabbi Yosheber, the, the older Rabbi Yosheber, 
that there was a, a, a magafa in, uh, in some uh, um, uh, cholera. How do you say it in, in, in cholera? A plague. A plague of cholera yeah. in inside his town. Mm. And he came in Yom Kippur, in the essence of Yom Kippur, and brought with him food to the synagogue and ate it in front of the entire community. Ate, he ate it, yeah. He ate it in front of the entire community that they will follow him mm. and eat because the medical situation of many people was fragile right. and would they fast they had a sakana of dying uh, uh, in the plague a risk of dying a risk of dying yeah so some rabbis came to him and say you are mekel in some yom kippur you you you're you being are, lenient you can you 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 take the the the, the fast of yom kippur as being not as, as serious he said, no, 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 you don't understand. I am very, very machmir. I am very, very strong. Stringent. On the issue of pikuach nefesh. Right, saving lives. Yes. 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 Is the, the, claim that, the claim that Jesus is making in the Gospels, that not only is he the son of God, but that the people are all the son of the children of God. And he quotes Psalms, uh, that you're all children of the divine and, and the supernal. Is that a controversial claim? Do the rabbis want the divine Messiah to be just the individual and not the collective Messiah? Well, I, this is in the Gospel of John. I don't think that the rabbis would agree to this specific understanding of the Psalms that you quoted. Uh, however, I would say, of course, uh, metaphorically, all of Israel are the sons of God because it says when, when Moses went to Pharaoh, this is the beginning of, uh, of Exodus, he say, B'ni uh, b'chori uh, Israel. My children, my firstborn Israel. Yes. And in, in the chapter in Deuteronomy, it says, B'ni matem la'ashem Eloichem. You, all the people of Israel are sons of of God, right? Uh, but this is, a, I would say, a general metaphorical issue. The question is about the Messiah. How to understand it? Is it real biological connection? Metaphorical again? This is a right. very long debate. Right. Interesting. Interesting. I um, <clears throat> I had a chat with some of your colleagues before we sat down for an interview, and I asked them, "What question should I ask you?" And I won't say who it was, but one of your colleagues said that I should ask you what your most, in all your research over the many years, what do you think is your most controversial, radical idea? And why is it really a traditional belief? Why is it really not so radical? Uh, well, I had many. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes science is like religion. Science. Science yeah. is like religion. Yeah. My first uh, book, which is based on my, my dissertation, was uh, I came with an, a view which was opposite to everything that was accepted in biblical criticism. And what, they, what was believed to be old, I claim, no, no, this is new and the opposite. So I saw that in terms of the, sorry, in terms of the dating of texts, dating saying. of texts, right. yes. So I I saw that uh, uh, issues of to be conservative and against new ideas, <laughs> usually people blame the Orthodox uh, group for this, but it is very much within within you know. Uh, it said, going back to the New, New Testament, uh, 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 Jesus said after the people of Nazareth, his, city, his home city, wanted to kill him after he, he took an aliyah in the synagogue and wrote, uh, read some verses from the Aftarah. And he said, the prophet Isaiah is talking 
about me in a way and they wanted to kill him. So he said there is no prophet in his town. So I can say about myself that actually the ideas of my dissertation were very quickly accepted and absorbed by the entire academic world except in Jerusalem. <laughs> So you have to ask yourself, why? <laughs> right. can, you, can you tell us very briefly what your thesis was? What was the core of your thesis? The core of my thesis was that it, it's about the priestly tradition in the Pentateuch. And um, it was common that the second part of, of Leviticus, which speaks a, a lot about Kedusha, about holiness, is the older part and the rest of Leviticus and the rest of the priestly issues and exodus and numbers are, are, uh, are later than this part about the, the holiness code, the Leviticus 16 to the end. I argued the opposite and I claimed also that we see here a revision in the views of priesthood with regard to holiness because holiness was before regarded as an issue which is only uh, connected with purity, non-purity, uh, sacrifices, uh, holy days, priesthood, issues like this, and not connected with morality. And the, the problem was that people thought that, okay, I will do all what I need in Ben Adam Lamakom, in issues between man and God. I will bring sacrifices, I will keep the Sabbath. And, but at the same time, I can cheat in business, I can behave immorally to friends in the community, because this is less important. The main thing that God wants is sacrifices, right. Shabbos. It's a common story, unfortunately. Yes. And, but we see it clearly in, in Amos, yeah, Micah, sure. Isaiah. This sure. was a great crisis of the, of the 8th century BC. It's, this is the period when these uh, prophets were, were active. Yeah. So in my view, uh, and as a result of it, the prophets are very critical yeah. of the, of the, temple, of festivals, yeah. of sacrifices, of prayers. God doesn't want it. He does not listen to your prayer. It's, it's disgusting for you, whatever you do, because yeah. you, your hands are full of blood of pure people. Yeah, very powerful and, words. And you cheat at them. Yeah. So I suggested that the second part of Leviticus, mainly chapter 19, is a response of the priesthood to this problem. Because oh, what is the beginning of chapter 19? It says, Kedoshim tiyu ki kadosh ani Hashem lochem. Talk to the entire community of Israel and tell them, you should be holy because I am the Lord, you God, I am holy. And there, there is a list. If you check the list of Leviticus 19, you will see that this is a, a mixture of purities, sacrifices, when you have to read the, the, this uh, sacrifice, how many days, and how do you achieve this purity and that purity. It is uh, about the Sabbath keeping, etc., uh, etc. Et but at the same time, it has about charity, about moral behaving in business, about you should love your neighbor like you love yourself. You should love the stranger. You should uh, give honor to elderly people. Beautiful moralic issues. And all of them are coming side by side. So basically the message is... Uh, Sanctity is not just sacrifices and, and holidays. If you want to please God, to become, to, to try to imitate God, sanctity 
you should be also careful about honest in business, about treating your neighbor in a proper way, about honoring the elderly people in your community, uh, helping them, giving charity to the poor. All of this is in Leviticus 19 at the same title of Kedushim to you. You should be all. Are you saying that's a priestly compromise to the prophets or is that their attempt? What's, what, what, what's the agenda there? I what are they doing? I would say they refine, they refine the concept of holiness as a response to the, I would say, crisis, mm. religious crisis within society with also the criticism uh, of, of the prophets. So they're taking the criticism on board, but they're also trying to keep the aspects of the... Um, they don't give up right, the temple. Right. Unlike the prophets, right. they don't give up the temple. Right. Temple is important, sacrifices are important. You should be very careful how do you treat the peace uh, offering, Zevach Shlachimim, right. with all the details. Right. 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 All the details. They don't, they don't give up the details of sacrificial laws. Right. But at the same time, at the same, uh, I would say, uh, um, same group. Uh, same circle, they put one by the other commandments of matnotaniim, gifts to to the to the poor people from your Cohen, uh, uh Again, lifnei uh, verlot iten mikshol. You should shouldn't put uh, an obstacle before the blind person. Many, many of the laws. Right. And we, the Ahavtalere Achakamocha, we mentioned Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva said, Zeklal Gadol Batora. Right. The, 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 the loving of your, your friend, uh, 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 like yourself, is, is, is the biggest uh, Klal principle, uh, principle yeah. in the Torah. Yeah. It is in Leviticus 19. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because historically it seems almost that those two tendencies, of let's say religiosity and morality, they often come at all, they come at the expense of one another, and we see this in the biblical times, and we see this today in Judaism, and and not just in Judaism, in all, in all religions, where people who typically are more ethically concerned, are concerned about social welfare and social care, um, tend to be less conservative and traditional religiously. If we can speak in very broad categories, and in the Bible we see as well that people are that are more concerned with with the temple cults and sacrifices are less concerned. And it's almost like this ideal, maybe even messianic vision, um, or the priestly vision that to have them both together, that they need to be, they need to come together. We can't, just have, we can't just have ethics and we can't just have spirituality. We need both of them to coexist. Yes, I agree. I agree. So, so at the last chapter of, uh, of my book uh, about this issue, which is called The Sanctuary of Silence, this is because the, the worship in in the temple was was dying in silence which is another ish, interesting issue but at the end of the book i said well not all the ideas that because it it was connected also with agrarian reformation which is the laws of shmita and yovel the seventh year and 50th year not all of this is uh very practical namely i don't believe that they kept everything uh, in, in history, right. but but it's an ideal an ideal program, right? An ideal to aspire to. Yes. You know they say a joke of uh, this fellow who works in an office with other with other it's a it's a Haredi office let's say with other mm. pious Jews religious mm. Jews and um, he put he had, he bought milk for himself and he put it in the in the bar fridge mm. and um, he comes back the next day and his milk is finished. Mm. And he's, so he, he tries next time. He, he buys a new milk and the milk is finished again. So he's upset. He puts a sign and he says, you know, he had the verse in, in Deuteronomy of uh, to not, not to steal. Lot Tignov. It appears twice, you know, in the Ten Commandments, um, in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Comes back the next day. He puts the sign. He puts the quote and, uh, and it's gone. The milk is gone. 
So he has a he he speaks to a friend, and friend tells you, "I'll write you a sign. No one will take your milk." He comes back. He puts a sign. No one touches the milk. The sign says, "The milk is not chalav Yisrael. <laughs> it's not a, it's not the highest level of kashrut." It's, yes. Uh, okay. This is the issue right? that people take seriously. Yeah. So that's a it's it's a it's a question of it's a question of misplaced value that the prophets are complaining against that not stealing. This is a biblical prohibition. This is a core of society. This is how we. Ten how commandments. We, Ten commandments. This is verses, and and uh, it doesn't really hold that much weight sometimes for people. But Chal Yisrael, Chal is it the right hechsher? Is it Mahadran? Is it glat kosher? Yes, is it this? that's true. That's so it's true. a challenge. You you asked me just w- before we started this interview whether I was a messianic. I'm wondering, are you a messianic? Ah, uh, well, this is not an answer which is. Uh, I am messianic in in some way, which is not. I don't uh, follow any any messianic uh, leader, and I. And I'm afraid of some of uh, the results of messianic movements. I don't, uh, I'm not afraid at all about Chabad messianism. I'm, I go from time to time to Chabad in my neighborhood and which are messianic. I just enjoy to read their literature and to see how they struggle with, with the issues. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to, to read. Um, but but I I don't see any danger to Jewish society coming from them. I am really afraid ab- about what will happen to Israelite society and that do Jewish people uh, from a, a messianic movement without a messianic leader. Uh, Namely, Gush Emunim and uh, and uh, politicians who represent it now, because I, you know, I I was in the organizing meeting of Gush Emunim. I I was a soldier. It was in the Yom Kippur uh, war time, and I was in uh, Nachal. So I, I did my service in the army uh, in, in Sinai, but I had a, had a, a, a day of uh, vacation. So I went back to the kibbutz where I stayed, which is Kfar Etzion, which my family is connected, I said before, to this kibbutz. And I happened to come to this visit at the same day or evening that people like Hanan Porat, uh, um, and uh, Rav Druckmann and uh, others, Rav Le- Rabbi Levinger of Hebron, gathered together uh, and out of this uh, uh, gathering this evening, the name Gush Emunim was decided. I was there. I was there. Uh, and they were troubled, it was shortly after the Yom Kippur War. So, you know, with the Six Days War, everyone holds this uh, expectation of uh, Geula, of redemption to come soon. Jerusalem, Jerusalem was uh, liberated, and etc., etc. And then came the horrible Yom Kippur War. And it was like a blowback. And here was the danger. The danger is when people start uh, to give an interpretation to history, they presume that they understand 
why God is, is leading history in this direction or in that direction. So the interpretation that they gave at that night in this gathering, I remember the exact location of the, the room where, where this, the gathering took place. They said something like this. It's our fault. The, the move of redemption is, is, is going back because we did, didn't do enough. What was our, our sin that we didn't do enough? Because, you know, you need what, what is called by the rabbis and Hasidus, Itaruta de letata with Itaruta de leila. Uh, how would you translate it into an English? An arousal from below to bring about the arousal from above. So we didn't do what we need uh, uh, from down, from the human part. And what was to, our... To evoke the divine response. To evoke the divine activity yeah. to go on in the, in the direction of Geula. Redemption. Redemption. And what was our misdeed? The Shomron, we are talking about 70, end of 72, beginning of 73, I don't remember. But this was the time. Yom Kippur was in, in, in uh, October 72, so it was around the end of 72 or beginning of 73. Uh, the Shomron was not... was empty of Jews. Samaria. Samaria was empty of Jews because the government of that time, which was the Labour Party, the Avoda government, they had uh, their political uh, plan, Tochnit Alon, Yigal Alon plan, that said, uh, we are not going to settle in the Shomron. This is an area full of, of Arab villages. We will keep it for the Arabs. We will do some settlements in, in, in the mountains of Judea, in the, in the um, Bika, the valley of the Jordan, uh, that's all. So they said, no, we have to build Itnachaluyot settlements in the Shomron to go against the government. And they started with it. This was the beginning of Gush Emunim. Namely, we know what God wants. Right. We can read the plan of God. And they are going with it. And I'm not sure that they are bringing our society and our government in a good direction. I would rather say, okay, we have the Medinat Israel. The state of Israel. The state of Israel. Let's rebuild it from within. Be careful that our society, what we have now, is just. Uh, the gaps between poor and rich people are not huge like they are now in Israel. Let's consecrate on, uh, on, on these issues, on the moral issues between us. Right. The issue of the, of that, uh, if the uh, Samaria is inhibited by, by, by Jews or not, let's wait for the Messiah to come. This, I, we don't have to decide w about the ways of God. Right. So this is why I left Gush Emunim, and I don't belong there anymore. Right. And, uh, well, the, the, the issue of Arab and Jews in this country is very complicated. It's not that I have a simple solution, but I think that it's better for our society if we go back to, to the issues of Leviticus 19 to give our effort on the Avta Lerecha Kamocha, 
love your friend, love the stranger, uh, respect the elderly people. I think there's a lot of, lot of things to correct in this, way, in this area of religion right. before we jump to building another settlement. Right, right, I hear this that. This is my view. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. <coughs> Let's change gears here a second. I want to ask the the core theme that's uniting all of these interviews that we're doing here and the theme that we explore um, on my channel, Seekers of Unity, is mysticism. And it's a very controversial word with a lot of ink that's been spilt and no consensus in academia, even what the word means. From your perspective, is there mysticism in the Bible? And if so, what? What manifestations of mysticism are you seeing there? What trends are emerging from there? How may we differentiate it from prophecy in the Bible? Maybe let's open up that side of the conversation. How would we differentiate? From, from prophecy, from Nevoah. Should, should they be differentiated? Are they the same thing? I'd be curious to explore that. Okay. I, I, well, uh, definition of mysticism is very difficult. Um, let me see that generally I would say that that the 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 the, the highest uh, experience of of mysticism is a, a a situation where you in some way are coming to some deep connection with God. I wouldn't use union with God because I think in 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 Jewish in Jewish eyes union with God is dangerous uh, uh, expression to use because as I said there is this long tradition that wants clearly to separate between the human and the divine so I wouldn't use uh, union, I say, uh, great prox proximity with God. And this can happen uh, as a regular status of some people, like Moses, who, who whenever he had to, could go to the tent of meeting and be in solitude with God. Mount Sinai, he stayed there and didn't eat and didn't drink for 40 days and nights, a situation which is above the regular experience. Um, and I would say that also through ecstasy, of, of dancing, music, some people can get uh, an experience of proximity to God for a short time. Mm. This is what we see mainly with the description about the Bnei in the time of, uh, of uh, Saul, the time of uh, Samuel, right? The, the the children or students of the prophets. Yes, it's not it's not uh, children of the prophets, but students. The of junior prophets. Junior right. prophets. Right. This is the best way to describe them. Junior prophets. Sometimes they rarely they themselves as uh, prophesy, but more we hear about them as uh, Hasidim of the Rebbe. The Rebbe is the Navi, and they are like he, the Hasidim who surrounds him. His disciples. Yes, disciples, uh, followers. Yeah. But in several descriptions that we have, we see that, that uh, 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 this is the transition that we spoke from the, the period of the judges when Israel didn't have a king. So they come and ask Samuel to to point the king upon them. And he, first of all, he, he comes to Saul and he anoints him with the oil. Um, 
This is a very old custom that we know from cultures before Israel. It's in the area of northern Syria, the area of the city Haran, which was the city of Abraham. We have text from there where we see that they, the, the anointment, the Meshich of, of kings took place there a um, long time before, before the beginning of the Bible. And it is explained there that, that um, we can see from the references that by pouring olive oil on your face, on your face, your face shine. Mm. It's some light come mm. out of your face. Mm. And this is the way that gods in this, this culture they perceive that the face are surrounded with light. Mm. So by by Meshicha, by by pouring the oil on your face, you are in a way elevated to a semi-divine status. Mm. So the, the, the word Mashiach is actually the one that an olive oil was poured on his face in order that he will be seen shining like the shining face of the of god that is very interesting you're saying that the word moshiach itself which literally just means anointed moshuach yes. bashem and to be anointed with oil already in the in the etymology and the ancient ritual already contains this germ the seed of yeah, divinization mishcha, right. mishcha is olive oil yes in aramaic yes and the, the use of the olive oil why why pouring it on, on the head right uh, is it Immediately, when you, you can try it at your home, take a good <laughs> olive oil and pour it on, on you. You will see that you, the, the color of your, your face is, is full of light. I think we're going to start a new TikTok trend. Yes, that's true. <laughs> I, uh, is that related to, is there a relation there to, to Moses who comes down from the mountain and yes, his face is shining? Yes, of course. And Moses, when he came, went down from Sinai, he was speaking with God. He has this uh, shining face. He has to cover his right. face. The light was so strong that people right. could not right. hear it. There is this. There is this motif um, in rabbinic literature of we could call it maybe the apotheosis of Moses, which appears also in Second Temple literature. Yes, that's true. That's um, true. Where where Moses in in the in in the Book of Psalms is described as Ish Elohim, the uh, the godly, the divine person, and the rabbis in the Medrash the rabbis say. Rabbis even say. Isha yakimenu ze Moshe, when it says on, in the Darim that, that God, uh, the, the, the husband is, is yakimenu, which means we'll establish, it. establish the, the, the uh, vow of a woman. Yeah. But they take it in a Midrashic way. It said Moshe is the Baal of the Shekhinah, he's the, the, the husband of the Shekhinah. Wow. And he tells the Shekhinah when to get up because he said been so Aaron, mm. when the ark is moved moving this is the number 10 right Vayomer Moshe, Kuma Adonai, raise up this is isha yakimenu wow fa fascinating this is very very strong wow. very strong so moses says uh, Kuma Adonai vecha, rise arise lord rise shina so he's the he's the divine masculine in that relationship yes, in some sense. Yes. He's also the divine feminine when he receives he the Torah. He, yes, plays, he plays true. both. That's Fascinating. True. Both. And then, both. Right. And then uh, and then we see he must have been in touch with his with his inner man and his, his inner woman, his anima and animus. He was. Yes. Uh, yes. So and then we see um, the same thing by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, right? When the way that he's described in the Zohar, that uh, Zohar is out of my... Uh, out of your expertise. Uh, yes, so but, I, but my the expertise reached the Book of Bayir. <laughs> I wrote an article about Book of Bayir, and this is the end That's of, the end of it. The end of but my the motif expertise. continues there, right? So the, yes. I'm sure you know, the, even yes. if it's in your expertise, know, where the, the verse says, um, Shalosh pa'amim yiraya kol zchucha et pnei Hashem lokecha. Um, that three times a year the children of Israel come to, to Jerusalem. Pnei Adon Hashem. It's Pnei Adon Hashem. Thank you. And the, the Zohar says, Man Adon Dahi Rashbi. Who is the, who is the master? Who is the Lord that, whose face you'll see? This is the Rashbi. This theme of, so you're saying this theme of, of apotheosis, of, of 
theosis maybe of the 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 prophet the messiah the redeemer being assimilated into god you're saying this is a theme which has mystical undertones of running course, through it uh, and and it runs part of your expertise is second temple literature these themes run yes, right into course, course. which is the matrix from where the new testament emerges and we have this so the divine messiah yes, uh, there is a, a qumranic document which i discuss in my book the messiah before jesus right when the the author of this document is is claiming at the same time he says i'm sitting on, on heaven me kamoni bailim who is among who is among me uh in the in the Bibeka Hebrew I would translate among the gods, but in in Qumranic words uh, Elim is Malachim. So he claims right. that he is greater that, than all the right. he sits in heaven and he's greater than the angels. This is this messianic figure messianic self figure. self professing. And in the same time he said who is uh, uh, sh rejected by people mm. like me, mm. like the suffering servant of Isaiah. Right, Isaiah 52. So when I saw this mixture in this document, I became crazy and I wrote a book about it. <laughs> the book, uh, there was a scandal, there was an article in the New York Times, there was, okay, I'm not that mature that because I have identified the figure with Menachem, which is the mysterious partner of Hillel, right. that uh, at the beginning Hillel was not with Shammai, with uh, his famous partner. Uh, yes, right. he was Menachem the Hillel, right. and Menachem went out. And uh, then Shammai entered. Right. What, what, what does it mean? Went out. Right. And many interesting stories in Babylon, Yerushalmi, and there is a Menachem among the Essenes in uh, described in Josephus. So I've tried to right. to connect that all of this right. together. There's also a Menachem in San in um, in tractate Sanhedrin, where where they say the name of the Messiah is Menachem. That's true. Right. That's true. Right. That's true. Same person. Uh, well, tracted Sanhedrin is is too late, but maybe they 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 kept a tradition about right. it, possibly. Right, possibly. What was the what was the New York Times article? What was the scandal? Uh, well, because uh, according to the sources, this person was was killed and was believed to rise to rise from the dead. Mm. So so sounds familiar. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So, uh, people sent, uh, I relied on the, on dating, which was done by a uh, great expert of uh, the letters of uh, Kumran um, writings, professor of the late Frank Ross of Harvard University. But uh, so I dated these documents to the Herodian period, to the time of Herod, which is also the time of Hillel. And I built uh, uh, all about this dating. So two scholars uh, wanted to contradict me and they sent uh, the documents to Carbon 14 uh, check. And according to their to their uh, testimony, it was earlier. It was from the Hasmonic period, before the times that I fixed them. And this was all of this was in the in the New York Times article. Writing now back, and this is included in in the last chapters of my book, recent book, the Messiah Confrontation. I I say okay, I'm. I'm not pushing for a personal identification of the man who wrote, I am sitting in heaven, I am superior uh, to the angels, yet I am the suffering servant of Isaiah uh, 53. I don't, I gave, I, I gave up in a way. But, 
this does not mean that the document is not there. The fact that I can tell you who wrote it, who is the hero, who is described in this way, uh, doesn't mean that the document did not exist right. in several copies, not just one right. copy, in the Qumran community. Right. So when scholars come and say, many scholars, Jesus could not think the historical Jesus in these terms of combination of messianic vision and being the suffering servant of Ishayahu, because the two did not exist together in Judaism of his time in one personality, I say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, people, respected scholars from Germany and the States, you are wrong. What you say is right before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm. Now we have the Dead Sea Scrolls and it is combined there. And also in the version of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, in the big Isaiah scroll of Qumran, which is presented in the shrine of the Buchan Museum Israel, there is a minor change in the chapter uh, of Isaiah 53, which is very important. Yeah, I'll hold that. Yeah. Thank you. In our version, it is said, the, fir the first verse of the, this is uh, Isaiah uh, 52, verse 13. Hine yaskil avdi yarum venisa vegava meod, kasher shamemu alecha rabim, ken mishchat miish mareu vetoaro mi bne adam. I would try to translate it into English. Uh, uh, my servant uh, would be with great success. Uh, he will elevate it. He will be very high. The same way as many people uh, uh, wondered about him and rejected him because his, his uh, figure Mushchat Meish Mareu, his figure was defected. Mushchat. So they just uh, look on him without any respect. But in the future, he will be great and great. In our version, it's written Mishchat. The Qumran version, they add another one letter, Mashachti. Mashachti meish mareu. I have anointed him, namely the suffering servant in the Qumran reading, already the suffering servant of Isaiah 52-53 was a messianic figure. Namely, he said for them, this combination of being rejected, suffering could be related to the Messiah itself. So the idea of a suffering divine Messiah did exist in the Qumran community, at least in some documents. This is not the regular vision of the Messiah in the Dead Sea Scroll. In the, reg in the most of the scroll is described as a warrior, Davidic triumphal warrior. But in two, three documents, which I'm mentioning now, he has a very different picture, very different image, a suffering Messiah, not a Davidic triumphal Messiah. Mm. So, so I, what I would like to claim now, uh, that we, we can we can put aside the question who wrote this uh, uh, very interesting 
document. It is called the self-glorification hymn because it said, I'm sitting in heaven with surrounding by, 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 by angel. I'm greater than the angel. But at the same time, I suffered more than anybody and I'm rejected, etc. Et He's flexing on the crowd. Yes. So let's forget about the issue of identity. Maybe it is just uh, imaginary. Can be. But the very combination of suffering and divinity uh, is, is, is already there 50 years before Jesus. So please don't tell me it is impossible that Jesus thought about himself in this way because he didn't exist in Judaism. He didn't exist in Judaism before the, 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 the great discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. But now we know that it is there. Right. But it's very much possible that via John the Baptist, who was probably a former member of the Qumran community, Jesus became aware of it. Fascinating. Fascinating. It's, it's, really, it's really interesting and it's really, it's, it, it's paradigm shifting research that you're doing. And I think it's rightfully ruffling many feathers in many fields. I'm curious to, I'm curious to, to bring a different perspective here and see what you think. We've been talking a lot with the other scholars here about the, about the internal process. We're, we're speaking now here about historical texts and documents and communities and etymologies. With the other scholars, we were talking about what is the psychological, the phenomenological, the internal experience? We spoke with Tomer Persico about the same verses about the prophet, uh, sorry, with King Saul, with the prophets, and, and what, what, how that experience of interior ecstasy gets transformed throughout the ages. You've, you, you've written, you say that your expertise goes up into the, the Bahir, but, um, but your knowledge continues up until today, until Hasidut, and it seems perhaps that there's a continuum of, of textual readings. And Moshe Dell has done a lot of work on this to connect what's happening in medieval Kabbalah with rabbinic and biblical sources. It seems that there's a continuum of these very strange themes of divine messiahs and, uh, and messianic mystics and all these strange themes that get, that get interpreted and reinterpreted in internal interior ways that become part of the the divine practice that a person can aspire to. Where in amongst the Kabbalists and amongst the later Hasidic authors, the notion of a divine messiah is no longer a political reality of a of a divine monarch, you know, hung over from ancient Greece or ancient Egypt, but it's a process in which oneself they can identify with elements of the divine and in that they're taking part of their redemptive process. I'm curious how much are these internalized um, maybe psychologized, humanized readings of these biblical motifs and rabbinic motifs that continue on. How much? How interesting are they to you? How much are they just too separate from the original context that they that they that they can mean nothing? How much do you try to find these original, what 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 starts as, you know, very idiosyncratic cultural and political ideas? How much can we find meaning in them? How much do you seek to find meaning in them in today's day and age? Does that make sense? The the question that I'm asking. What I see uh, very interesting and in the book of Bahir, let me talk about book of Bahir. Uh, I agree with, with Sholem and others that the origins of the book of Bahir were in the East. I think in Iraq, in Babel, I think around the uh, ninth, 10th century. Bahir is at the, at the end of the book is making a marvelous uh, uh, step when he said, when you say bracha, when you say, let's say, bracha, a blessing, a blessing on any mitzvah, on any commandment, let's say, bracha on lulav, on the palm trees that we are uh, uh, commanded to take in the festival of Putz, Sukkot. Baruch. אתה השם, אלוקינו מלך העולם, אשר קידשנו במצוותיו, וציוונו על נטילת לולב. 
So, Bahir is saying, <coughs> Blessed are you, God, King Look of the at universe. The yeah, who, please give the translation before. Who commanded us to take the palm branch. Who sanctified us with his commandment. Say, say take, it slowly. Baruch. Blessed are you, God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments to take the lulav, the palm branch. So Bahir is saying like this. Look at the grammar. Syntax. You say, Baruch ata Hashem. Namely, you, are talk you start with the second person. You say, Blessed are you, God. And then you continue in the third person. Melech HaOlam, the king of the world, Asher Kitshanu Bemitzvotav, he sanctified us in his mitzvot and he commanded us to take the lulav. So, Bayer is saying, actually, we are talking here about two personalities. One, which we say, Hashem, that we are talking about in, in the second person. But the king of the world, who is also the commander of the mitzvot, is another personality that we talk about, the other personality, in uh, third language. Do you agree in terms of grammar? There's one word which you missed there, which is Elokeinu. Elokeinu is... Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu. Uh -huh. That's first, second person. Yes. God, God, Adonai, is, is our God. Right. But there is also, this is the way, the reading of the Bible. Right, right. Some, someone other, Melech HaOlam, Asher, which who, commanded, who right. is the king of right. the world, which commanded us in, in his commandments to take Lulav. I mean, it's strange syntactically because you have to create two sentences. Yes. <laughs> but, but the point is a, is a good one. It's a good one yeah. in terms of, of, of grammar, yes, right? Yes, 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 yes. So for the Bayir, we have our God Adonai, but he's not the king of the world. And he is not the Metzave, he is not the commander. Who is the king of the world? Who, who is the Metzave? This is Tzadik Yesod Olam, the Tzadik, according to the Bahir. Tzadik Yesod Olam. So, so, wow, it's very radical. The, the Tzadik, the saint, is Melech Olam, is king of the universe? The Tzadik? Which is, it's a question, who is the tzaddik? Right. Are you I'm saying not saying that it is a, a Hasidic tzaddik, right. but there is a personality called tzaddik, the who righteous, is the, the melech, figure. the king of the world, uh -huh. and the commandment of the mitzvot. Okay. How shall we see, look at this split, which is seen in the first, well, the, when the Bahir was written around the, 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 the around in the world around it, there was a very strong uh, struggle of monotheistic religions with Gnostic religions. Gnosticism, Manichaeism, which Bahir knew very well. Um, and the main issue in Gnosticism and, and the religion of money is Manichae, Manichaeism, Manichaeism yeah. is to say that the creator of the world is evil. Right, the demiurge. The demiurge, right. the creator of the world is evil. Right. So we are imprisoned in a world which was created by the evil demiurge, the evil creator. And our uh, release is the knowledge, this is Gnosticism, the knowledge, the meaning of the word is, is knowledge, 
that far away there is uh, there is this good uh, divine personality which is not the creator of the world. So actually, I, as I understand it, I wrote an article about Bahi. You can see it in my site in Academia. Uh, the they claim against Gnosticism the Bahir, the author of the Bahir, the, the, the author of the Bahir, that the creator of the world is Tzaddik. Namely, the world was created by a very good force, Tzaddik Yisod Olam. Right. So they don't disagree that there are two gods. They're just saying yes, that, yes. that there is a creator god, yes. but he's good. And there is also evil, which was created right. by the first god, but evil is uh, in the north. He's not the creator of the world. Right. So this is more optimistic, more optimistic vision of creation, much more. Right. Yet... It's still not, it's not monotheistic. It's not fully monotheistic. Right, right. And what it, it says is that, yes, and in this sense they agree with Gnosticism, that there is a good force which is above creation, is not responsible for this world. He is there with its full holiness, but he is not... The, responsible to what's going on in this world. Let me say, for me, I have a, I have a problem with the Bahir, and on the one, the one way, and in the other way, Bahir gives me some options. What is my problem? As I mentioned to you in our conversation, uh, I'm coming from a family that the great part of the members were killed in the Holocaust, including my uncle, which I am named after him, that he went to another city, we was married, had this little baby, and we even don't know what happened to them? We don't have even a yard site for them. And um, uh, all the family of my father, most of the family of my mother, perished in the Holocaust. Among them, Talmud Chachamim, like those I mentioned, and and uh, we we'll studied in Chachmei Lubrin, and other people who were tzaddikim and tzaddikot. And, you know, with all the yeshivot and the universities and schools and people that I talked with, I don't, I never had a good explanation uh, for this. <laughs> Any interpretation of the Shoah as a preparation for something, in my view, I'm not, I'm not satisfied, I know, I mean, the suffering, the, the amount of suffering, it's not just a quantity of, 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 of suffering, but the way, the, the brutality, the cruelty. Well, if God is responsible to all of this, I find it difficult to relate to him. So... I cannot speak about a tzaddik who is the director of this world because this world is not was not directed in the way of of tzaddikut between righteousness between justice in the time of the Shoah I don't see there a way of tzaddikut but uh, Bahir is saying to me in any case. There is this sublime force who is uninvolved in history. I can come to this 
deity who is uninvolved in history from Bahir. Okay, I can come from Maimonides because the god of Maimonides truly not in the, in the Yad HaChazaka, but if you read the Moré carefully, and this is why the Moré was burnt by, by Jews in some way, in some places, because actually you read the Moré carefully, God is not involved in history. I know that in Chota, New York, my mother said the opposite. I know, I know. Uh, I know a little bit of Rambam, but, but in principle, the God of Rambam was an Aristotelic God who is not involved in history. So you see, I'm crazy in a way, because on one way I want to support the, the, the Zionism and the Messianic movement of Zionism in, with some limit, which is in history. I don't say I want to be outside of history. But when I faced the Holocaust, I said, oh, it's easier for me to live with a God who is not involved with history. So this is uh, how I live. Uh, not with the perfect, <laughs> perfect soul. I don't, I don't have rest uh, and peace. Right. The sages say that the, the righteous don't have rest and peace. Tzadikim ein lehem menucha. Ne neither in this world nor in the next world, right? Oh, okay, depend on the verses. <laughs> Maybe in the world to come. What is the... I'm curious because what we're doing here is we're not just speaking to an academic audience. We're also speaking to a public audience, people with everyday concerns, with bills to pay, with children, with worries, with faith and doubt. And, and what is the takeaway of your scholarship? If you look sort of bird's eye view... Not, not for the academic, not for the historian, not for the biblical scholar, for the average person, the person in their everyday life. What can, what can someone take away meaningful from your work? Well, I think... Uh, there are various issues. They, they, they call for morality, behavior, Avatarea, the love of friend, the love of the stranger. This is very important. And it's very, very relevant to our days. I mean, we live in an age of hatred. The world is full of hatred. I, I spent several of, of my years on life uh, in the States. Every sabbatical I would go, I did my postdoc at Princeton, that's with the first year. And then I went for year 95, 96 uh, uh, to California. I taught at Berkeley and Stanford. Then I came in 2000 to Chicago. I taught at Chicago Divinity School. And um, so I had some experience of the United States. In my last visit, my last visit, I came, I went, it was uh, like five years ago, I went to Harvard uh, to teach there for one semester. And I met a different United States. The hatred between among Democrats and Republicans was not similar to anything I've seen in the 90s and, and um, anything. I mean, this society, became, uh, I was in at, 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 at uh, Boston in the way, a week after this march in Charlottesville and the Jews, some of the Jews, second generation of Holocaust survivors were afraid because they promised to come to Boston and people were shaking in the United States because white supremacy people promised to come to Boston. I mean, they came and there was a great objection to them from many people, not just Jews. But, but I said, wh where I am? And all the time of my stays was under Trump. And, and, and I saw how hatred is going from both sides. And it's, and 
I'm sorry to say, but this is what's something similar to it is 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 now coming to to this state. I mean, the situation was was not perfect before, but now people are coming and making more and more hatred among Jews and Arabs, among left and right within Judaism. Uh, 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 so the call to love people, to respect the stranger, um, is very important. Leviticus 19 is very, very relevant. This is one, one, one thing that I would like to, to, to promote. Um, another thing is that my personal history, which I gave you just part of it, uh, is full of, of uh, family suffering. And I, I don't have a, a beautiful solution to it, but uh, as a human being, I can share the, uh, the experience that studying, singing uh, can help you to overcome things that you don't have good solution to them. This also I took from David Hartman. He would, con I would stay, I mean, how can we sing this song? We don't believe in the words of the song about God doing these miracles, etc., etc. He say, no, no. When you sing, this you, when you write an article, just think if you can accept it or not. Maimonides say this, and this, yeah. this is when you write an article. When you go to the synagogue and you are with the community, just sing with the community, with the simple people. And I found that this is a very good advice. When you are with the chavura, with of the people and the minyan, and there are a lot of synagogues here. I go to Marokai, Ashkenazi, Parsi, whatever. And uh, uh, sometimes I'd say Dvar Torah uh, to them. I have also now a Parshat Shavua uh, in, in, in YouTube, uh, which I give uh, every week. Uh, and uh, I can relate myself to the community. And you know, when I say Dvar Torah in a, in a synagogue of simple people, I will talk to them in their language and I will sing to them with them their melodies. And I, as David Hartman advised me, while I sing, I can identify myself with the community, not asking the big questions. And this is also something that I, I can share mm. that, that and Hasidut is very much about singing and dancing. Yes. So also dancing. When you dance, when you dance with the community, you're part of them. Forget about what happened. I mean, this is the experience, as I understand, the experience of Saul. That, you know, he came in the second story. Saul the king. Saul, Saul the yeah. king. He sent people to kill David. <laughs> And they came to the Bnei Anivayim, to, to the, 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 the group of es, uh, ecstatic uh, prophets, and they danced with them, and they forgot about what was commanded to them. Really? Even Saul himself, when he came, he forgot about his hatred to mm. David, and he danced there all the night, even took off his clothes and the whole night he danced there and uh, was was lying like like dead person uh, or the whole night this is some in some way it reminds of stories about Baal Shem Tov mm -hmm. that had an aliyat neshama and mm -hmm. was seen like like a dead person so he had so, an elevation of the soul yes elevation mm -hmm. of the soul so dancing singing is something very ancient in our tradition. It's not 
innovation of Hasidut. <laughs> so we should, my, the, 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 the son of Maimonides, Rabbi Avram, wanted to, to renew it because he saw it with the Sufi people. Right. They're dancing. So right. my, my wife wrote a, a play about it, about mm. um, um, Rabbi Avram, the son of Maimonides. Oh, nice. I'd love to see he, that. Because he had some cats. He wanted to bring all Israel to Nevoa. And he said, how can I bring... I mean, not bring via more Levuchim with philosophy. Right. Bring all of Israel to prophecy. Yes. Right. How can you bring all Israel to... Not via philosophic studies. I mean, not all of Israel can read more the... Guide for the The guide. Yes. It's impossible. But if we will dance like the Sufi... He said the Sufi are doing what the sons of the V, of the prophets, did in, as we read in the book of... Let's, let's have it uh, again. So he didn't, I mean, not many people followed him, but several generations after that, Hasidut came. In a way, Hasidut is a fulfillment of the vision of Rabbi Avraham, the son of Avraham. Beautiful, beautiful. Do you, do you, Professor, have a favorite nigun that you like to sing? Favorite nigun? I'm not Balmenagan. <laughs> you will sing. I, I will join to you. If you suggest someone, if you, if you suggest one, I'll, I'll, join, I'll, I'll begin with you. אם אמרתי מצרג לי חסדך השם יסדני אם אמרתי מצרג לי חסדך השם יסדני אם אמרתי מצרג לי מתי מתי מצרג לי חסדך השם יסדני חסדך השם יסדני, ואם שרה פי שרה פי בקרבי, תנחומך ישעשון נפשי, ואם שרה פי שרה פי בקרבי, תנחומך ישעשון נפשי. למה אתה בוחר את הנגן? זה קשור, לא? כן. It is related what, to what we talk. Imam Marti Mataragli, if I say, King David writes in the book of Psalms, if I say that my foot slippeth, my foot is sliding. Imam Marti Mataragli, Chastacha Hashem Yisdeni, God, your kindness, your loving kindness will, will be a foundation for me, will hold me. Bejev. Sarapai Bekirbi. My, my, my thoughts, my questions, my... Inside of me, Tanchumecha. Mm. Your, your, nacham, your comfort, your, your comfort, your, your comfort, tanchamecha, will will comfort my soul. Will 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 be a bomb to my soul. It's a nigan from Reb Meir. Reb Meir Shapiro is nigan from Reb Meir. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You see, I thought that's I why don't, you... I don't remember. I didn't remember it when I started to do, but when you. Remind me, I remember that this is Rabbi yeah. Meir Shapira, yeah. Yeah. Chachmei Lublin, yeah. that we mentioned several times. Yeah. Wow. Now it's, great. yeah. Mal Menagin. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Many, many great Nugunim. You know, they say, now it's Tchilatan Besofan, Besofan Betchilatan. The end is wedged in the beginning, and the beginning is wedged at the end. We started off by speaking about Ruzhin and Chartkev and Chassidus and Rabbi Shapiro, and we ended up with yeah, a Nigan from Rabbi Shapiro. Nifla. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Pleasure is mine. That's it. It's Galgano. It's Galgano, it's Galgano. We began and we, we came back. We should, uh, while, we're, while we're still on the mics, we should thank the Shalom Hartman Institute for hosting us. How many years have you been here? 40. 40 years. 40, 4-0. Uh, more than 40, 43. Wow. <laughs> before I was even an idea, before, before I was even a thought in anyone's mind. Uh, so the series is being conducted here with the Hartman Scholars, hosted on the beautiful Hartman campus in Jerusalem. And uh, we're grateful for them hosting us and allowing these conversations to happen and to, to share the, the knowledge and wisdom and beauty and love of the scholars here with the, with the general public, both here in Israel and abroad. And it's our will, it's our hope that it, uh, that it will serve to, to further, to bring, to promote 
understanding, kindness, unity, love. The shem yichud kuchabrich roshchinte to bring to bring together things that need to be brought together. That's our hope. Lachaim. <laughs>